Hel hello and welcome to this much reduced version of a presentation that Professor D D Deborah Johnson and I gave at Stammerfest Global at the University of Liverpool in August. And then the title of that presentation um, was Stammering and Academia, University Lecturing with a Stammer. Both Deborah and I have spent numerous years in the academy and we both st 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 stammer. And we're interested in making the academy a better place for students who stammer and also st st staff who stammer. Um, as I said, this is a much reduced version of that presentation. I can't hope to replicate the presentation here. Um, for example, there was a discussion afterwards and unfortunately Deborah cannot be here with me in my back bedroom. I would say that this summary version was um, produced in response to popular demand. And that is partly correct. One or two people said, I wish I could have been there. Over enthusiastically, I said, well, in that case, I'll do a summary. And um, at least one person said, that's a good idea. And so I felt I had to commit to th that. And it's taken me some time to get round to recording this. But here you go. So the focus of this uh, reduced version um, will be to start with a brief overview of the inclusion agenda in higher education before I go on to look at three aspects of how fluency is privileged within the academy. And I will be looking at teaching and learning, um, assessment, more generally the voices of the academy, um, I'll be concluding the presentation with a consideration of how we approach the normalisation of dis disfluency in the academy. So if we start by looking at um, the role of inclusion in higher education. So higher education is involved in the active pursuit of inclusion policies. The adjustments, changes to practice and greater awareness of the needs of students and st st staff with disabilities and the responsibilities of institutions as well as the individuals within those institutions is to be welcomed. There is legal protection through the Equality Act which places obligations on higher education institutions to protect employees and students from d d discrimination. And indeed, we can say that inclusion is the business of higher edu education. But Bolt reminds us that this uh, inc inclusion um, agenda takes place within a context of Able, ableism. Disability is still positioned as the other. So reasonable adjustments then are positioned as a means of achieving inc inc inclusion rather than uh, a system which challenges inherent ableist structures and cultures. And if higher education was to um, challenge these in ableist structures and cultures, it might render those reasonable adjustments unnecessary because we had a culture where disability was not othered and it was not discriminated against. And further, Madriaga discusses um, the pervasiveness of normalcy in higher education suggesting that higher education is reluctant to welcome that which is not normal. Disfluency, stammering and other speech 
differences and disabilities are not on the agenda of higher education incl incl inclusion policies. Um, they may be marginalised. The disfluent voice is positioned as ab abnormal. Uh, or it just or disfluent voices might just be ig, ig, ignored as if um, people who speak like me don't exist. And we don't associate disfluent voices within the academy, yet we know there are a lot of them. So if we look at the proportion of people who stammer in the general population, it's considered to be between one and three percent. We can apply that to higher education context and we can estimate that up to 69,000 students uh, who stammer in the in UK higher education and 12,000 members of st 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 staff. This is not an insignificant number. So where are they? Well, um, either um, they may be a covert, they don't want to disclose. Um, and there's any number of reasons why those uh, people who stammer are not v visible in the academy. So looking at the ways in which fluency is privileged in the in the higher education and i'm going to look firstly at learning and teaching so this is a core business of higher education uh, much of that learning and teaching relies on speech mediated either face to face or increasingly digi digitally we know from various studies that fluent speech of lecturers and people in, in similar roles is more likely to be rated more positively than speech that is less fl fl fluent. A limited number of studies have looked specifically at stammering and have shown higher education students have a negative perception of people who stammer. And this is seen in research by Silverman and Painter, Dorsey and Gunter, Betts, Blood and Blood. So can we excuse higher education institutions if they prefer to hire, hire fluent speakers and continue to demand excellent oral skills in their job specs? If they are focused on giving students what they want and what leads to high satisfaction scores, can we just not can we just not excuse them? Well, no. Firstly, because higher education shouldn't be doing this. Um, and even if this is um, preferred by students, higher education has a responsibility to challenge these taken for granted assumptions. And also, we know that this negative perception can change over time and with greater exposure to different voices. Another problem with um, re relying or assuming the fluent voice to be the preferred um, way of speaking in higher education is what uh, Carpenter et al described as um, the, um, how students become vulnerable to an illusion of knowing. Because something is conveyed in a fluent way, it carries more weight than if it's um, conveyed uh, by a disfluent voice. So Deborah and I would argue that, um, uh, that disfluent voices should be equally legitimate in higher ed education. If we look at all assessments. This is another example of the way in which fluency is privileged in higher education. So all assessments are common in higher education and take many forms. Um, they exist across uh, 
disciplines and they include things like uh, standard individual presentations they might include group presentations uh, professional discussions viva voces um, oskies which are observed structured clinical examinations um, and an attraction of oral assessments in in higher education is that they potentially represent an authentic form of, ass of assessment for example group work but also they are they are attractive because of cost and time efficiencies potentially so for example it may be um, considered to be more preferable to have an oral presentation because it takes up less time to mark than an essay particularly when it's marked uh, live and this runs a risk of the style of delivery being weighted more highly than the con con content and this gives rise to this illusion of knowing that I mentioned uh, previously. So can these issues with oral assessment be addressed by reasonable adjustments? Well, this is an unresearched area and knowledge of potential adjustments uh, may well be lacking in higher education institutions. An extra time might not be appropriate or available, um, for example, with um, OSCE type um, ass 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 assessments. More generally, adjustments for people who st 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 stammer might be more complex than they first appear. So additional time may seem like an obvious adjustment. Somebody gets um, another 10 minutes on a presentation, five minutes, what, 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 whatever, certainly in relation um, to the length of time of the original present pres presentation. Um, so this adjustment uh, might be welcomed, but it's not always necessary. So additional time might be provided. And that might make a student with a stammer more comfortable, not because they necessarily need that additional time, but because it allows them to present without being hurried and without running the risk of being cut off at a particular time. But additional time may not be adequate if the assessment criteria values fluent speech and that is a real pr pr problem so if the assessment criteria uh, refers to fluency or to clarity of speech this uh, would likely disadvantage ev anyone with a speech d d difference including a stammer even where these elements are not explicitly referenced in an assessment cri 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 criteria, those assessing the presentations may value, unconsciously or otherwise, may value that fluent speech over the con con content. And further, um, there are many misunderstandings around st 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 stammering, which might mean that stammering can be misinterpreted as evidence of uncertainty, evasiveness, lack of familiarity with c content. A student who stammers may avoid particular words uh, or, to, or they might employ certain phrases in order to avoid stammering. And those words might not be the words that they would have said um, if they didn't have a stammer and they might convey a different meaning as well. So even if a, a presentation sounds fl fluent and doesn't have any obvious stammering in it, the student may still be at a disadvantage because they are co covering um, and swapping words. So this is actually quite a complex um, 
area. Now, Deborah and I would argue that stammering is no barrier to giving it an effective presentation. But as such, higher education institutions need to reconsider what constitutes a presentation and what constitutes a good presentation and how presentations can and should be assessed. Looking more generally to voices of the academy, we argue that fluent voices dominate the academy. One area that I am particularly interested in is lecture capture and auto captioning. This is where lectures and other presentations are recorded through popular tools that are used in higher education institutions such as pan, pan, panopto and these technologies include um, an auto captioning uh, facility which provide a um, captioning or a transcript of the spoken word and understandably these are positioned as an inclusive pr practice giving access to um, students who, who are una unable um, to access the, the, um, the audio content, for example, if, if, if they are de deaf. And that is, um, that is to be expected. The, the content should be accessible. But lecture capture is far from inclusive for staff who stammer or who have other speech differences or disabilities. Captioning is not sensitive to stammering, resulting in inaccurate captioning. And YouTube is um, similar in this regard. Um, it is predicated on fluent speech. Now, we know that captioning can be edited, but this puts an additional burden on the member of staff with a speech difference. And YouTube, for example, as I mentioned, um, I will have a lot of work to do once I've recorded this and uploaded it in terms of adjusting the auto ca ca captions. Now, I want to put captions um, on my videos because I believe they should be accessible to people that will not be able to hear the audio con a content, content. And I'm willing to do this for this video. But for people um, who stammer in the academy, you're putting extra um, um, expectations of additional labour onto them without a corresponding adjustment to their work work load. Um, I'm going to briefly mention the three minute thesis. I've made another video on this where I uh, pull that apart. The three minute thesis is exactly what it says. It is a three minute oral presentation summarising a thesis. Now, VType, the uh, organisation that promotes the three minute thesis in the UK, has no information on adjustments on its website and it offers no advice on making the three minute thesis more accessible. And it leaves these decisions to participating institutions and of course participating institutions take their rules and their guidance from uh, retai. Um, so this reinforces that fluent voices are the ones that should be heard in the academy and to not think about how to make it more accessible I think is just lazy thinking and um, personally, I've lost respect for such an exercise. 
Uh, Dane Isaacs is a South African academic who has uh, written about the everyday time pressures within the academy. We might call this the chronopolitics. And the examples that he gives are how various members of the academy, including lecturers and library staff, who would express that they didn't have time to engage with his disfluent speech. Leadership of higher education is also dominated by fluent v voices. There are some exceptions, of course, but stammering should be no b barrier to progression within HE, and stammering voices can represent and lead H -E, e. So finally, uh, in conclusion, um, we need to find ways of normalising disfluency. Now, I've suggested that disclosure or sharing um, the um, sharing that you have a stammer might be one way um, of that of that becoming more accept accepted. And I would support anybody that decided to do that, that chose to do this. But it needs to be a choice because there are consequences to disclosing a a disability. And people are not always welcoming of that or supportive of that. Stammering openly goes along um, with that disclosure and stammering openly is a radical act. But again, you need to be comfortable that that is going to be accepted because um, this is a, con a context that values fl fluency as some kind of... Um, um, as, as the preferred way, way of sp speaking. There is also um, researching stammering is a way of um, um, putting it back on the disability agenda um, to, uh, to take stammering more seriously as res researchers um, so, so that it is recognised as, as a disability that we need to develop knowledge on and there's also stammer educators which is a um, professional network affiliated to stammer that consists of people various people that, that work in the education sector um, and there's also a possibility that um, a, a network focused on higher education staff who stammer might be appropriate um, for a collective support. Now there are, that's the, I've come to the end of uh, this presentation, there are several pages of references that I've included um, here. Now, unfortunately my picture just obscures the words at the bottom. I'm not going to read these out here but um, I will make them available somehow, uh, probably on a Google doc so that they are ac accessible and post that um, at the bottom of the YouTube link. So thank you for l listening, for tuning in and um, I'll no doubt pop up in another video um, on stammering and academia or just generally stammering um, at another point in time. So catch you later.